Would you tell us something about the nation of Islam? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful. Uh, the nation of Islam, as you know, uh, this is what Ibrahim, peace be upon him, uh, prayed for when he and his son Ishmael uh, rebuilt the foundation of the Kaaba. According to the Quran, Ishmael and Abraham prayed that Allah would accept their work and that he would make them Muslims and that he would raise from their offspring a nation of Muslims. And so when the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, started his mission, his mission was in fulfillment of the prayer of Abraham to begin a nation of Islam where all the inhabitants of that nation would have as a common base the Quran, uh, the Sunnah, and the practice of uh, righteousness. And so that nation flourished under the guidance of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And as one of the speakers downstairs said earlier, the first generation of Muslims were the best. Then the second, it was less. Then the third, it was even less. And now there is a prophecy of the coming of Mahdi, one to guide the Muslim world back to Allah. That is telling us that as Satan promised, that he would come to us from before us and from behind us and from the left and right and he would make all deviate. It would not be necessary for a Mahdi to come if we were still on the straight path. So now a new reality has come up in the West called the United States of America. Every human being on the earth is represented in the United States. But at the bottom of that heap, of humanity is 30 million black people whose fathers were brought to America as slaves, many of whom were Muslims. But in the making of slavery or making us slaves, we were robbed of the knowledge of Islam, of the knowledge of our own language and culture. So one came to us, his name is Farad Muhammad, and he came to bring us back to the path of Islam. And he called us the lost, found members of the nation of Islam. The nation of Islam is the totality of the human family, but we were lost from that reality, and we now have been found and are trying to again become Muslims as we believe our fathers once were. So then there isn't any, any real reason to, to believe that there is a separatist tendency that you are aspiring or you're advocating? You know, this has been put upon us that we are the separatists, while in fact the truth is we didn't come over here in integrated ships. We were in the holes of the ships and our captors were up top. And when they made us slaves, we didn't live with our captors, we lived in slave quarters. And this went on for 300 years. And even up to 30 years ago, we could not go to toilet with white people. We could not eat in a restaurant with white people. We could not even be buried in the same cemetery with white people. So we are not the separatists. They are. But we recognize that our nature is Islam. And we want to live a righteous life as taught by the Quran. If America cannot abide us being black and then accepting Islam, then what we are asking for is the same thing that the Pakistanis asked for when they asked to be separated from their own racial brethren over the difference between Hindus and Islam. And if you have nothing to say about the nation of Pakistan becoming an independent nation, separating from Hindus, 
Why should you have any objection to us as Muslims forming a separate nation, separating from Jews and Christians, which the Quran told us that we should not take for friends anyway? Now, you alluded to in your reply about uh, to the coming of Mahdi. Uh, do you see for yourself a role of that nature? No, not at all. No, I am a student. I am an insignificant student who believes in Allah, who believes in Islam, and I was taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad a method of how to reach black people with Islam. And I am applying that method, and people are coming by the tens of thousands bearing witness that there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. And now, that same methodology, I am working among the Native Americans, the Indians as they are called, and I am working among the Chicanos, or the Hispanic people in America, which nobody is working with and among. And believe it or not, there are many whites on the college campuses of America that our methodology has attracted to the pristine purity and the goodness of the faith of Islam. How far have you come and where do you see yourself now with, with your mission and where do you think you are going? Thank you. Our mission, as stated by our leader and teacher, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, he called it the resurrection of a dead people, the total transformation of our life from a savage lifestyle to an Islamic or Quranic lifestyle. If you ask me on a scale of one to ten where we are in that mission, I would honestly and respectfully have to say we may be at stage one or two because the first thing is to spread knowledge and get an acceptance of that knowledge. That is happening at a very fast uh, a rate of speed. But then the next thing is the practice of cleaning up our people from drugs, from alcohol, from laziness, from dependence, from adultery and fornication, even from cigarette uh, 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 consumption and alcoholism and from wife beating and child abuse, all of these are the things that we are now trying to get our people to clean themselves up from. And then we get into the deeper aspects of the faith of Islam. What comments do you have on uh, media's assessment of yourself and, and, your, and your mission and your people and your work? Well, the first thing we would have to ask is, who is the media? Who controls the media? And what is their purpose? You see, if you have a Christian, Jewish, dominated, particularly white, Christian, Jewish, dominated media, then do they love Islam? Do they love black people? Do they promote justice and fairness in the media among themselves, much less among us? And now, if you look at Louis Farrakhan, you have to look at me in the context of how this whole problem with the Jews uh, began. I've been teaching for 35 years, and I have never had the reputation of being anti-Semitic. In fact, the term is a bigoted term, for there are 160 million Arabs who are also Semitic people, and I am not accused of being anti-them. So are the Jews the only Semites on the earth? Have they taken... Uh, uh, the badge of Semitism to be exclusively their right, I think we ought to dispense with that term as a false term. I am not anti-Semitic. I am not anti-Jewish, nor am I anti-white. I am anti-injustice, exploitation, and the evils that the Quran speaks about, which every righteous person should be against. And so, if you remember when the controversy started, it started in the context of the Jesse Jackson campaign. And Jesse Jackson 
running for the nomination of the Democratic Party to be President of the United States had a view toward the Middle Eastern problem vis-a-vis -vis Arab uh, Israeli relations that was so vastly different from any person who has ever run for that high office that the Jews feared Reverend Jackson getting a foothold in the American political system with his view toward Israel and the Palestinian question. And so when I came to stand by uh, Reverend Jackson's side, they took some of my words out of context, called me a hater, a bigot, a racist, an anti-Semite, and lambasted me for five years or six years now. But thanks to Allah, we have weathered that storm. My remarks were, uh, they were comparing me with Hitler. And I've never had a fight where I've had to bloody another human being's nose. I've never been arrested for any criminal action or violation. The only time I've ever been stopped in America is for a speeding ticket. And they gave me a citation when I went to renew my license for over the a three-year uh, period of my license, I have not had one speeding ticket. So I'm in complete compliance with the laws of the United States. Uh, but they wanted to depict me as a violent man so that I might fit into the mold of a terrorist, so that the government of the United States, through its anti-terrorist division, could use their powers to destroy uh, Louis Farrakhan personally and the nation of Islam. But again, all praise is due to Allah. The American public is beginning to hear what I'm saying. I said Hitler was a wickedly great man. And what I was criticizing was not the religion of Moses, which we know was Islam, and the revelation that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to Moses and through Moses to the children of Israel. We said that that nation called Israel has not had any peace in 40 years. And she can never have any peace because there can be no peace structured on injustice, thievery, lying, and murder, and using God's name as a shield for your dirty actions or your religion. Your religion is not what you profess. Your religion is what you practice. And if lying, thievery, murder, and injustice is what the Zionists are practicing against the Palestinians, we submit that they are practicing dirty religion using God's name as a shield. You alluded to the Quran and uh uh, my understanding is that in the Quran there, are, there is a mention of Ahl al-Kitab, people of the book, and the Quran exhorts uh, Muslims in a, in a positive manner rather than a negative manner to... to it begin. exhorts us in both. Yes, we respect those who follow the book. Why shouldn't we? We respect Christians who try to live up to the righteous message of Jesus Christ. And we respect Jews who try to live up to the righteous message of Musa, like we respect Muslims who try to live up to the message and preachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But look at Satan's boast. When uh, Shaitan and uh, Allah were having a conversation, and Allah uh, uh, said, uh, in words to Satan, that he was driving the Satan out, accursed. And Satan said, because you, Allah, have adjudged me to be erring, I will lie in wait for them in thy straight path. And I will come to them from before them, from behind them, from their left and from their right. And I will make all of them deviate, and you won't find most of them thankful. As long as Musa was in the world guarding the purity of his revelation, he kept his community intact. But when Musa left, then the deviation came in. So you have many Jews today who have deviated from the practice of Moses. And you have many Christians today who have deviated 
from the practice of Jesus Christ. And those Christians and those Jews who have deviated in their deviation, they have become friends of each other in their deception of the peoples of the world. And you also have some Muslims that have deviated from the teachings of Prophet Muhammad. They still claim to be Muslims, but they are wreaking havoc in the Muslim world as those deviates are wreaking havoc among the Christians and the Jews. So we really can't have friendship with anyone who has gone astray from the guidance of God. We can only cement friendship when we all come back to the purity of faith as taught by Moses, Jesus, and Prophet Muhammad as the seal and end and finisher of the faith. Uh, talking, talking of the faith, uh, how does one affirm faith uh, in Islam? In other words, I really want uh, to know what shahada means to you, or how do you yes. interpret it? I'm very glad that you asked that. You know, babies say what they hear mom and dad say. But it doesn't have the same meaning to the baby that it has to the parent who taught the baby to say, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu an Muhammad and Rasulullah. Well, now, you ask me what that means to me. It means to me that God is one, He has no associates, no rivals, no partners. And that if I bear witness that he alone is the power in and over my life, and I came to the knowledge of him through the teachings of the Quran as taught and exemplified by Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and I didn't know anything about Prophet Muhammad, anything about the Quran, until I was taught by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who led me to the study of the Quran. So now, to me, my declaration of faith is not just a word, but it must now go deep into the heart. For it is only when faith is rooted in the heart that a transformation in human life takes place. Allah says in the Quran, say, we submit, but faith has not yet entered into the heart. We submit that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger, but how deep is our faith in those words? You know how we can tell how deep it is? By the work that you perform after that kalima, after that shahada. Now, Prophet Muhammad made that declaration, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad an Rasulullah. And his work was to convert the known world to that same statement. So his work justified his faith. What about yours? What about those who question me about my uh, definition of faith? What is your definition of faith? And what is your works that support what you say? So that you sit in judgment of me as though I must measure up to some a false uh, a, a criterion that you set for me, but my work testifies to my faith. Where's your works? I'm converting by the grace of God tens of thousands to the faith of Islam. What are you doing on behalf of Allah and, the, and, 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 and Messenger Muhammad? So in, in my judgment, I think faith means many things to many people. There are politicians who say the same thing. But when they make a judgment, they don't judge from the Quran, they judge from political expediency. And you never ask them, what is your declaration of faith and what does it mean to you? What does it mean to you, Saddam Hussein? What does it mean to you, King Fahad? What does it mean to you, uh, King Hussein? What does it mean to you, uh, Imam Khomeini? What does it mean to you? See, we are not courageous enough to ask the people at the top where the corruption is coming from, what does faith mean to them? In the Bible, there's a, there's a, there's a verse in the Bible, in the book, um, I think it's in Romans, I'm not sure. But it, it reads like this. Paul is speaking, a disciple of Christ, and he says, We war not against flesh and blood, 
but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and spiritual wickedness that is going on in high places. I think the word should be put to all the leaders of Islam. What does Kalima, what does Shahada mean to you? Because the people did not become confused until the leaders split up the religion into sects and parties, each one vying with the other because of envy and jealousy among themselves. Prophet Muhammad was not Sunni. He gave us the Sunnah. Prophet Muhammad was not Shiite, but without Prophet Muhammad, we would not have Ali or Fatima or Hussein or Hassan. You see, uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad was not Hanafi. He was not Hanbali. He was not Sufi. This is your thing. We, we're going to go back and discuss the Shahada a little bit more. Uh, let us go back to the second part of the Shahada. Is your interpretation of the Shahada uh, regarding the second part, regarding the Prophet Muhammad, uh, is, that a, is that very clear uh, for yourself and for your followers, or is there a question that, the, that Muhammad implies Elijah Muhammad or some other Muhammad? I'm very glad you asked that question. There would be no other Muhammad if there were not Prophet Muhammad. And there would be nothing for any Muhammad to speak about if Prophet Muhammad were, were not raised by Allah through Jibreel and given the Qur'an. So if we bear witness that the Qur'an is the final message, then we have to bear witness that Prophet Muhammad is the final prophet. And when I say Prophet Muhammad, I'm saying Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah. Now, however, the Qur'an says this, that Allah's mercy, He is ever giving His mercy. And the Qur'an says Allah is ever or continuously sending revelation. There is no revelation that will come to us based on that Qur'an that will come other than in the name and under the name of Muhammad because it was started by Muhammad. And Muhammad only lived uh, 62 and a half years. Is that correct? But every bit of revelation that will come will come due to the book that God revealed to Muhammad. So all revelation up to the hereafter will be based upon that book. And so everybody whom God reveals anything to, it will have to come in his name. So Muhammad is the first and Muhammad is the last. Are you, are you implying that there will be revelations uh, in the prophetic tradition in the future till the end of time? Or I don't want to say in the prophetic tradition, but you have to admit that our world of Islam is in bad condition. You've had the prophet and you've had reformers, but our world is still ruined. Do not you need some guidance? I would say so. And who is going to guide you if it is not Allah? And what book will you be guided from if it is not from the Quran? So because the book was revealed to Prophet Muhammad and through Prophet Muhammad, that doesn't mean that Prophet Muhammad gave us the full depth and breadth and height of every word of Allah that is found in that book. Then we would be um, minimizing the depth of a God who is so far seeing and so far knowing that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, didn't see the full end of every word that Allah brought through him. But people are going to be raised up from time to time that will give us messages right out of the message of the Quran. And they will be not just common messages, they will be divine messages, but they will not be called prophets. I see. So uh, this brings up a, a big issue of the finality of the prophet and the finality of revelation. What I'm hearing you say is that through the message of, Quran, of the Quran, there is always a need of redefinition, ref reformation, or for any of the leaders to be inspired through the Quran 
Am I correct in interpreting that? I'm saying that as long as we live in this world, this Quran will continue to reveal more and more of its precious meanings to those whose hearts are pure by God's grace, and he impresses upon their hearts deeper understanding of something we have been looking at for 1,400 years. And that's what I'm saying, but they will not be called prophets because Prophet Muhammad ended that when he came with the final book. But Prophet Muhammad did not bring the end of understanding of that book. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah 3, uh, the family of Imran, where Allah is giving to all of us rules of interpretation. He says that there are verses of this book that are decisive. Some describe it as decisive. There are verses of the book that are allegorical. And those in whose hearts is a disease, they will use the allegorical verses to create division, but they will stay away from those decisive verses of the book. Then Allah says in the Quran, but none knows its meaning save Allah, period. And those firmly rooted in knowledge say, we believe in it, it is from Allah. So no matter what scholar you choose, He's limited. Unless Allah guides him, he's still limited. And the problem with us in the Muslim world is that we've become exactly as the Quran described. We've taken our monks and our doctors of law for lords beside Allah. We bow down to scholars rather than to that wisdom that is in that book. And I think we have made uh, uh, some grave errors that we are paying for now in the division, the hatred, and the bloodshed that is being shed uh, among us as Muslims. I hope I'm making clear that none knows the meaning of the Quran but Allah, and he reveals that to whom he pleases. And if Allah pleases to reveal more of that book, he'll reveal it through a human being just as ourselves, and that human being will be based, he will base everything that he says on that first man, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, through whom the book comes, and he will be a faithful witness to that man and to that book. Well, don't you think uh, when you say this, there would be uh, further claims for, uh, for prophethood? Uh, that, that has already happened, even in North America, within, within the Muslim community. Well, I guess there will always be persons who may want to claim this and that. And my saying that did not, would not start it, and my saying that won't stop it. So I can't be charged with that. But then, you know, there is a criterion that the Quran gives to measure the claim of every claimant. And if we are are fair and equitable and just, and our hearts are pure, if our claim is in error, not because the masses of the Islamic world uh, agree that I'm in error, because the masses of, the, of belief has not always been right. When the prophet came, he was one man against a mass that believed totally different. When Musa and Esau came, they were one person against a mass of people who believed differently. The Christians and the Jews took issue with the prophet, and the religious leaders of the prophet's day took issue with the prophet. So it doesn't mean because everybody in the Islamic world accepts a position that it is necessarily right. And it does not mean because the scholars of Islam issue a fatwa that that fatwa is necessarily right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the judge. And as we said today, Allah said he knows best who is erring and he knows best those who go aright. And I think it is, it is shameful that so many of us want to put on Allah's robes rather than dress in our own garments.
Uh, what part does the Quran play in the life of a Muslim, in your opinion, or should play? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said one day when I was reciting something from the Bible, he got very angry with me, and he said to me, the Quran is the root of Muhammad, and the Quran is the root of a Muslim. And he said, I will not rest until the Quran becomes the book and the law under which all of my people live. So the Quran is everything to a Muslim, it seems to me. It is our guide in every aspect of human life. Uh, why do Muslims place such great emphasis on uh, Prophet Muhammad or his life or his conduct? Because uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the living word, the word in flesh. Allah never sends a book without a man. And that man not only reveals, uh, the book is revealed through him, but that man is the example of what is in the book. And the further we get away from that man and his example, the further we get away from the book. And it's clear that we have gotten further away from the man, not from his name now. We all know how to say Muhammad, peace be upon him. But we're very slow in following the example of the man. So we've gotten further away from the man, further away from the book. So the Quran says of itself that they treat this revelation as a forsaken book. He couldn't have meant it during the time of the prophet when it was being revealed, but many today do not judge with this book. They put the book behind their backs and they judge from their temporal knowledge gained in the colleges and universities of the world. Is, uh, is nationalism compatible with Islam in your opinion? At some stage, yes. And in another stage, no. The clot is compatible with Islam, but it's not fully developed. The embryo is compatible, but it's not the fully developed fetus. So when Allah said he was going to raise up uh, a Muslim and a nation of Muslims, then, of course, came uh, the thought of a nation. But the thought, in, as I understand it, in the mind of the prophet was a universal thought, not nationalism, but a nation in which all human beings, black, brown, red, yellow, and white, could live together in peace and brotherhood under the banner of Islam. Now, if we look at what has happened to our world, when the Europeans and our own corruption broke up the caliphate, which is what the Europeans wanted. They themselves carved up the Arab world and set up 22 nations. Now, I ask you the same question. Is nationalism a part of Islam? Evidently, you think so, because we have put the priorities of nations above what God has said in that holy book. So that question should properly be asked to the Muslim world and not to me because I am not a nation. I want to be a part of a nation, but the nation that I want to be a part of is not America, is not Saudi Arabia, is not Jordan or Sudan or Egypt. I want to be a part of that nation that God wants us to be a part of, and that is the nation of submission to the will of God. Very good. Now, uh, what in your opinion is the, is the process of empowerment for, say, the Afro-American Muslims, or Muslims in general in this country? Allah introduces himself to us in the Quran in words that are translated to mean, I, Allah, am the best knower. You can never empower a people until the people have been given true knowledge. Allah, I mean the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, one learned man is harder on shaitan than a thousand ignorant worshippers. 
and I think you will agree, we have millions of ignorant worshipers and too few who have bathed themselves in the ilm or knowledge of the book. Uh, how should uh, Islam be introduced, uh, say, to this society, in your opinion? That, I think, is the most challenging question of all, because this society has been based on slavery, injustice, racism, and white supremacy. How should we introduce an egalitarian doctrine among a people who don't want equality with anybody that has skin color like you and me. And they don't even want equality with white people if they are poor. How do you introduce Islam in this kind of society? To me, the reason I mentioned in my talk that you do not see America unless you see America through the eyes of Quran. And the reason I said that is because the Quran identifies Moses and speaks of Moses more than any prophet. There's a reason for that. Because Moses is the greatest sign of Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, how did uh, Allah introduce that development of Islam into Egypt under Pharaoh? He never went to Pharaoh or any of the Egyptians. He went to a slave. And he raised up Moses from among the slaves as a giver of guidance and good news both to Pharaoh and to the children of Israel, according to both the Bible and Quran. Now just take that, those principles and lay it over America like a draftsman laying something over. Now you're going to draw here are black people who were brought to America, not on the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, but in the holds of ships, slaves. Here is the ruling class, the modern pharaoh, Bush and his people. You know, they're the rulers. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but to me, he's pharaoh. I don't see him as just the president of the United States. I see him as the modern counterpart of that pharaoh. And that pharaoh was so wicked that he hatched a plan to kill all the male children of the children of Israel because he feared their multiplication. And I don't believe, sir, that it is an accident that 25% of black men are hidden away in prisons in America or on parole or court supervision. I don't believe it's an accident that drugs are in our community and guns coming in with the drugs to facilitate our slaughter of each other. There is a plan, a diabolical plan behind it. I say that to end this, uh, the answer is, I believe that the introduction of Islam in the United States will not come through the whites of this nation, but it will come through the oppressed. And since we are the oppressed, Allah has to do for us what he did for the oppressed in the past. He has to raise someone up from among us who speaks the language of us. There is no need for another revelation but to use the revelation of the book, the Torah, the gospel, and the Quran as an instrument of re re revivifying or reviving spiritual life, not only in black people, but in American people also. And that method, I believe, is being carried out now. now you're, you've been on the speaker circuit. You're, you're in great demand as a speaker, as I gather. You, uh, what I want to know is that how are you spreading the word of Islam and what uh, efforts in Dawa, if I may use the term, uh, are, you, are you planning or what is your strategy? Allah says in the Quran, call to the way of Allah with goodly exhortation and in the best manner. And he said, call to the way of Allah in good voice. And then he said, call to the way of Allah with justice. Now, 
everywhere that we go in America, by the grace of Allah, thousands and thousands of people are coming out to hear. We are not just teaching, pardon me, what one would call um, the principles of faith. Um, we are teaching the people those truths that we believe will lead to their um, re recognition of Allah and recognition of the value of their lives and recognition of the fact that we have erred from the straight path and a desire to get back on to the path that we have erred and strayed from. And the result has been phenomenal. I would usually give a lecture and not ask the people to join. I would just give a lecture stirring their consciousness. But this last year, I started asking the people to say these words. I believe in Moses and the Torah. And why did I say that rather than just say, I believe in Muhammad and the Holy Quran? Because this is a people that don't know anything of the Quran. They only know the Bible and they know very little of that. But they know the Bible is divided into two testaments. Although the Quran teaches us that there was one book that Allah gave to Musa and one book that Allah gave to Jesus. But they don't know these things. So we ask them to say, you believe in Moses and the Old Testament. They're comfortable now. And we believe in Jesus and the gospel. And they say, oh, that's good. And they're comfortable. And then I take them from the known into the unknown. Because in my lecture, I'm taking the words of the Quran and the words of the prophet and the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and relating it to the Quran, to the Torah, to the gospel so that they begin to see that revelation is not many, but it is one continuous and evolving thing with Muhammad bringing the finality of it in the Quran. And so lastly they say, I believe in Muhammad and the Holy Quran. Now the Muhammad I'm referring to is the Muhammad who brought the Quran. Now I say to them, I bear witness that there is but one God. And after they say that, I bear witness that Muhammad is his messenger. Then thousands of them, no, not thousands, tens of thousands of them Amen. are taking that shahada everywhere we go. And Allah willing, if he spares me till December, we will be in the Coliseum. Inshallah. And inshallah. And we hope to put 93,000 people in the Coliseum. And since you live in Los Angeles, if it is Allah's will, I would love for you and our brethren to see, listen to I was me. there the, during the last rally. Okay. Had. Then this one, uh, inshallah, if 40 or 50,000 of them take their shahada, we're going to invite Native Americans. We're going to invite the Chicanos, and of course, white people who want to come are welcome, and the black are people. And with the help of Allah, you will see an effort, a da'wah effort, that is successful. And I'm not saying this in any boastful or bragging way, because that's not the way of a Muslim. But I would love to share our methodology with everybody who is in da'wah work, because in reality, Islam in America, except among the indigenous African-American Muslims, has almost become an incestuous kind of an affair. And I hope that that's not being disrespectful. And when I say incestuous, I, I'm not trying to say that we are cohabiting with our own children. But the Pakistanis meet with Pakistanis. And the, you know, the Arabs meet with Arabs. And the strange thing is, the people in America, they've been sitting in churches 
all their lives, and when you bring them to the mosque, it is a cultural shock. You sit them on the floor, and then you speak to them in Arabic. And they're sitting there. They don't understand, or you speak to them in Urdu, or you speak to them in some other language, but that shows that you're not interested in da'wah. Because Allah says in the Quran, he never sent a prophet, but that he speaks the language of the people to whom he has been sent. So it's evident that you have not been sent to America. You came to America. You weren't sent by Allah to do any missionary work because you have failed as missionaries. I'm not trying to be smart, but your mosques are not flourishing. They're dying because you have not the right methodology of reaching the American mind. And I respectfully submit uh, in the most humble way that I can say it, we are being successful. And young men every week, young women every week, they stand up, they take the shahada, and we take them, see, we teach them, we sit them in a seat, mm -hmm. because that's what they're used to, and we teach them. Then when we teach them and they accept, we put them in classes to prepare them to really mean what they say when they say there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Then we teach them prayer. And then we teach them, you know, washing themselves, becoming clean in their body, in their language, in their disposition. And we give them rules and laws and regulations to discipline their lives. We take the women and put them in separate classes where we teach them to lower the hem of their garments. We teach them how to cook, how to sew, how to rear their children, how to be good wives to their husbands, how to act at home and abroad. And then we're trying to strengthen the family which slavery has destroyed. But if you just say to people, take the shahada, and you don't have a programmatic approach to raising people from one level to another, then all you may end up with is a lot of people wearing beards and kufis and jalabiyas and saying little Arabic words, and you will be so tickled, you'll say, oh, there are Muslims in America, because that is your vanity. You want Muslims made in your image and in your likeness, and when we come to you looking like you, then you reject us. Oh, look at them. Oh, you know, they're in America, you have on a suit, and they come robed in the garments of the Prophet. You know, Dr. Abdel Nasif, he came today. When I meet him in Saudi Arabia, I meet him in the garment of the Saudis. When I meet him in America, he's dressed in a suit. Nobody says anything. He's speaking the language of the people to whom he's sent. Now, we're doing da'wah work dressed strangely. The people look at us very strange. They see a person, they don't know what this mishwak is that we have in our mouth, and we're picking and picking and going on and talking, you know, and we want people to accept uh, the religion, but the principles of the religion are perfect. You know, our, our way is outmoded. Time has left the way, not the way of Islam, but the old traditions uh, you know, need to be re-examined, reappraised, so we can get about our work of spreading Islam, particularly in the Western Hemisphere. And if America becomes Muslim, inshallah, then look at what effect that will have on the entire world. If I may just close this looking into the camera, I want to say to all of our Muslim brothers, I want to refer you to uh, Surat al-Abasa, where the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, was talking to some highly placed persons, and a poor man, a blind man, was tapping his way up to the Prophet and disturbed him as he was entering into this discourse. And the Holy Prophet frowned because that man disturbed him as he was making an inroad, he thought, with these learned uh, people. And when Prophet Muhammad frowned on the blind man, Allah frowned. And Allah revealed Surat al-Abasa. He said uh, to the Prophet, peace be upon him, you know, in words, you are trying to talk to people who feel themselves above need 
of your message. But the blind man who has a need from him, you turn away and on him you frown. And I don't believe that that's just a message to the prophet, but it is a message to the Islamic world in America. Of course you would be happy if President Bush accepted Islam and the Secretary of State and members of Congress. That would make our job much easier because then they would get on television and teach the people why they accepted Islam. But the rulers as a rule have always opposed the faith before accepting it. And Pharaoh only accepted it according to the Quran when he was drowning. As he was going down, he said, I bear witness that there is no God but Allah. So Allah saved his body. Well, I don't know what Allah will save of this world, but let me say that the black people in America are the oppressed, and they are spiritually blind, and they are tapping their way up to Islam. And when you come and you meet us in our savagery, in our ignorance, and you see us a little unclean, a little unkept, and, 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 and we are like a disturbance to you, on us you frown and you turn away and you treat us like little children sometimes you know you give us a little a little bit of money and you know we like children we're supposed to go away and get a little candy and 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 and, and be happy you know but uh, you know this is a serious work that we're involved in if you would allow those of us who are successful to teach our people to reform them to clean them up guess what the whites of this nation will ask the question, how did you reform a people that none of us could reform? And then we got a chance to bring out the Quran and says, well, Allah says this. Prophet Muhammad says this. And they'll say, oh, that makes sense. But don't waste a lot of time on those who feel themselves above need of the word that we believe in. Give your time and help to those who are in need and whose satisfaction of need will make a great Muslim nation. So I close with these words from the 90th surah of the Quran, which is titled The City. And since this is 1990, and it contains a warning to Mecca and a warning to the Muslim world, really. And what will make thee know what the up Hill Road is. It is to free a slave and to feed an orphan and to raise a man humbled in the dust. And I respectfully submit to you that the mental slavery in America can be addressed by you. The orphan who was deprived of a mother and a father when they killed our mothers so we couldn't speak our mother tongue and killed our fathers that they couldn't name us after themselves and transmit the culture. So we grew up without language, meaning our mothers are gone, without our own names, meaning our father is gone. So we are orphans. And you are not good in feeding the orphan or freeing the slave or helping to raise a man, a people that have fallen in the dust. So I respectfully submit that the Americans are boasting that you said that you would spend billions of dollars to support an army in the Saudi desert. How much will you spend to repair broken human life. May God bless us to get our priorities straight that we will please Allah and as brothers come together for the good of Islam. Well, I must thank you, Minister Farrakhan. We kept you long enough. But there is so many questions and I'm sure there will be many more from our viewers and I, I sincerely hope that when you are back in Los Angeles, we'll be able to have one more opportunity with you. And at that, uh, I would like note, to thank you 
and to say to you and the viewers, not only one more opportunity, but as many opportunities well, should you desire. We are ready to be taught. You teach us. No, we are I ready don't, to be. I'm not a teacher. I'm a student. So, <laughs> thank you. God bless you. Thank you so much.